Hello everyone and welcome to A Close Reading from Herman Melville's Benito Serino. We'll be working on the opening scene. This is my copy of uh, The Piazza Tales as published by Broadview, which is where my first exposure to this story came from. Uh, by way of preface, the following quotation is cribbed from the Spark Notes article on Benito Serino. Um, the Spark Notes divides the novella into three parts and this is from the, the summary of part one. Benito Serino is Melville's only work of fiction that deals directly with slavery. Therefore, it is bothersome to Melville scholars that the story is so maddeningly enigmatic. As critic Varner Bertoff has pointed out, figuring out Melville's attitude is nearly impossible. One could fairly argue that his attitude is forgiving, patronizing, or even contemptuous of black people and or slavery. Beth's edit, naturally, the opposite argument could also be made. Back to Spark Notes. Like much of Melville's work, the popular interpretations of Benito Serino have changed depending on the political and academic atmosphere of each critic. That last bit about interpretations of the story reflecting the biases of the critic, that's absolutely true. And you will probably get a sense from the analysis that I'm about to provide what my biases might be. And I am okay with that. Um, I am going to do my best in this video to point out things that I see in the text. Um, you know, explain them as needed for, for basic comprehension. But to point them out without interpreting too much what they suggest, their implications, how they ought to shape your thinking. I, I Really what I'd like to do is just sort of scrape them out and, and, and delicately dust them off like a paleontologist and then just leave them there for your consideration. Um, I do hope that you find it proves enriching for your reading experience and I can't wait to talk through this piece with all of you come our next class. Do come prepared with questions, as will I, um, or points of interest that you'd like to discuss. Uh, but for now, break out your text and uh, turn to the very first page, and we'll begin. I am going to read from the first line to the end of the fourth paragraph at Saya Imanta, and I am going to take a moment just now to explain that Saya Imanta is Melville's description of, of sort of traditional garb worn by uh, women of a particular occupation in Lima. I don't know well enough whether he's describing the clothes that most women would wear or whether he's just trying to describe a particular variant of style that would be worn um, well by, by women who, who walk out, by, I guess, what we would call street walkers. Um, the idea when he gets to the Saya Imanta is that it's, it's a fairly comprehensive sort of a robe um, that partly covers the woman's head and face, that, that she sort of peeks out from inside her robe. It partly obscures her. It is in part um, a display. Her clothing is in part a display and in part a concealment. That is the main takeaway that you need to get from, from him mentioning this, this person, you know, in Lima, walking the plaza, wearing her... Saya Imanta, whatever Herman Melville intends that to be. So, beginning at the beginning. In the year 1799, Captain Amasa Delano of Duxbury in Massachusetts, commanding a large sealer and general trader, meaning a seal hunting vessel and, and general trader, lay at anchor with a valuable cargo in the harbor of St. Maria, a small desert and uninhabitable island toward the southern extremity of the long coast of Chile. There he had touched for water. First place I stop here. Valuable cargo. Valuable cargo of what? Valuable why? Valuable how? Normally, I would expect... I don't expect that to be a detail that's left unsaid, right? Um, the This... This ship has advertised itself as a sealer and general trader. All of that is fair and above board. So why not just say what 
the cargo is, um, it strikes me as a conspicuous absence. And that immediately gets me thinking about, okay, what are the valuable cargoes of the time? Are we talking about, you know, valuable fabrics or, or spices or sugar or people? Even if it's not people, something like sugar tracks back to people. This, um, this ellipsis, this gap, this carefully unsaid thing already shadows forth a, a sort of ominous silence um, that bespeaks the subject of our text. It's a teeny tiny thing. And it's difficult to say that an absence is a something. But sometimes it is. And I suggest that here it might be. On the second day, not long after dawn, while lying in his berth, his mate came below, informing him that a strange sail was coming into the bay. Ships were not so plenty in those waters as now. He rose, dressed, and went on deck. The morning was one peculiar to that coast. Everything was mute and calm. Everything gray. And there I stop again. Mute and calm. Mute? Mute is a particular way of saying silent. When describing the weather, when describing a, an outdoor atmosphere, I expect someone to say that everything was silent or quiet and calm, or to describe certain sounds perhaps as muted or muffled, like if it was foggy and the cries of seagulls were muted as a result. Melville here says everything was mute and calm. And that has an ominous feeling to me. Mute, mute is a, a like a problem, it, it's a, a disability, or it's something that's been imposed on somebody. Um, and there's something about this phrase, mute and calm, that, that tweaks my brain, and it turns out that it makes me think about the title. I remember the first time I read this story, I skimmed over the title and, and thought about the meanings of the Spanish words, and then it was right about here, mute and calm, that I went, whoop, and I popped back up to the title, and I thought, hmm. Benito Sereno, or Sereno, when we're saying it in our fast, anglicized way. Benito um, would translate to the English name Benedict, but it means, essentially, good or blessed. And many of you may know this and be able to parse the implications here even better than I can. Um, sereno means serene or tranquil or, more simply, quiet. Good, quiet. Benito, sereno. Maybe it's because I'm a woman and I'm a bit sensitive to these kinds of things. But when I hear good and quiet jammed together so intimately that way, I just, I just get rebellious. I immediately, there's something in me that pushes back against that. It reminds me of, of a command, be good, be quiet. An equivalency to be good is to be quiet. Behave yourself, keep quiet. Already, this sounds oppressive and ominous, and I don't like it. Everything was mute and calm, everything gray. The sea, though undulated into long roods of swells, seemed fixed and sleeked at the surface like waved lead that is cooled and set in the smelter's mold. Roods, um, rude is sort of an antiquated word. It can mean like a, like a rod or, or pole, um, but it's also an antiquated name for a cross. Uh, as like as in the Christian cross or or a Roman instrument of torture. So the sea is undulated into long roods. It's like the waves resemble rods, and Melville uses a very specific word that conjures up in our mind not only 
rods or sticks, but also crosses. Those are two different implements that are used for inflicting pain on people. And in the case of the cross, very specifically, it's an empire's tool for inflicting pain so as to ensure obedience. It was a punishment for rebels, which is one of the reasons Christ was condemned to die on a cross. To die on a cross. The sea, though undulated into long roods of swell, seemed fixed and sleeked at the surface like waved lead that has cooled and set in the smelter's mold. So I'm seeing like a blacksmith's shop, somebody forging something in, in metal or in lead. I, I feel heaviness. Melville's whole description of the ocean here, just, just a couple of lines, is riddled with specific language and imagery that's meant to make us see implements of oppression, beating sticks, crosses, smelted shackles or weights. We don't yet know, through the eyes of Captain Namasa Delano, who's just been told that a strange sail is on the horizon, we don't yet know anything about this story, what it's going to be about, who it's going to be about, what kind of ship that is coming over the horizon. But by the hints in these descriptions, these word choices, and some of the conspicuous silences, like about the nature of the valuable cargo, we there's already at the very least a sense of ominousness. We're at sea in 1799. What could be ominous? Well, lots of bad things happen at sea, but roods and shackles or, or, or lead cooling in the smelter's mold. Slavery is already all over this thing. Its fingerprints are in every sentence of the opening couple of paragraphs. And the sea seemed fixed and was sleeked at the surface like waved lead that has cooled and set in the smelter's mold. The sky seemed a grey surtout. Flights of troubled grey fowl, kith and kin with flights of troubled grey vapours, among which they were mixed, skimmed low and fitfully over the waters, as swallows over meadows before storms. There you go, we've got everything grey, we've got Gray birds, gray clouds, gray wisps of fog, namely troubled vapors among which the birds are mixing. We've got a sense of ghostliness. And what exactly is a ghost except the manifestation of someone who has died come back to haunt? Um... And the birds skimmed low and fitfully over the waters as swallows over meadows before storms, so that there's that foreshadowing, this sense that there's going to be a storm, whether it's a literal storm in the weather or, or a storm amongst people. Um, shadows present, foreshadowing deeper shadows to come. That's the line. All of these atmospheric qualities are shadows foreshadowing a deeper darkness, a deeper fog, a thicker mystery yet to come. To Captain Delano's surprise, the stranger viewed through the glass, meaning this, this boat, and he the first way he describes this ship is as a stranger. Again, amping up the mystery, the sense of we do not know each other. The stranger, viewed through the glass, showed no colors, meaning they flew no flag. Though to do so upon entering a haven, like a, like a harbor, however uninhabited in its shores, were but a single other sh where but a single other ship might be lying, was the custom among peaceful seamen of all nations. So what Delano is saying is that even though they're kind of in the middle of nowhere, if a ship is coming into to harbor, trying to come near the shore, on the off chance that maybe just one other ship might be in the area, the custom uh, among, you know, normal ships 
is to fly your flag, basically to declare yourself, to introduce yourself, to say, this is who I am and I am coming ashore um, or I'm coming into harbor. This boat is not doing that. Yes, to do so was the custom among peaceful seamen of all nations. Considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, okay, so we get the sense that, like, this is kind of a, a no-man's land. This is like a like the, the, the dark alleyway of the ocean where anything can happen and, and bad stories come out of here, perhaps of pirate attacks or, or you know, bad stuff. Um, considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some uneasiness. Had he not been a person of a singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable except in an extraordinary and repeated incentives, except on extraordinary and repeated incentives, and hardly then, to indulge in personal alarms." any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man. I'm going to back up and read that sentence again in its natural flow and tone because it just it's dripping with irony, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit. Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some easiness had he not been a person of singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable except on extraordinary and repeated incentives, and hardly then to indulge in personal alarms, any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man. So this, this is Melville's big disclosure about who our narrator is. We've just got his character in a nutshell. There are all kinds of reasons for Captain Delano to be on his guard, wary and suspicious, given where he is and what's going on in the strangeness of this ship that they've just encountered. But Captain Delano is a person of singularly undistrustful, meaning singularly trusting, good nature. He gives everyone the benefit of the doubt at all times, because that's who he is inside. He is not liable or not prone. He doesn't tend to accept with extraordinary and repeated incentives, except unless he's given a really good reason, and, and perhaps more than once, to distrust somebody, unless he's really pushed to consider someone malignant, malicious, evil, bad-intentioned, he doesn't. He assumes the best. Hardly even when he's given extraordinary and repeated incentives, hardly then does he indulge in personal alarms, does he get worried or suspicious or concerned, particularly as regarding the other person's dark intent. He never imputes or, or attributes malign evil to the other person unless he's been given repeated extraordinary reasons to do so. On the one hand, that sounds lovely. That sounds like a lovely sort of person, the kind of person that I want to spend time with. And, and maybe like a strong person, you know? Maybe he has, he has reasons in, inside himself and in his experience for being that way. But also, needing to be given repeated and extraordinary incentives to exercise one's faculty of reasonable doubt exercise one's, one's critical, suspicious judgment. Now we know. Now we know. This is Captain Delano. This is our narrator. This is who we're with. Whether you consider that description of Captain Delano's personality to be an explicit statement, like whether you think that this is Melville spelling it out for you, that this is an unreliable narrator... Or whether you just think, this is who he is. This is the, the good American captain, you know, the, the, the strong, jolly, courageous Yankee. You know, like, that's who he is. Maybe we'll find out. We'll find out through how he conducts himself in the rest of the story. Anyway, to finish off the paragraph. 
whether in view of what humanity is capable. Such a trait implies, along with a benevolent heart, more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perception, may be left to the wise to determine. This is Melville speaking. This is the writer, not Captain Delano. Whether in view of what humanity is capable, such a trait, this, this tendency to give the benefit of the doubt, along with a benevolent heart, you know, good insides, whether those reflect a more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perception, whether those things correspond to intelligence and good judgment, this may be left to the wise to determine. Melville is saying, you decide. You decide. But whatever misgivings might have obtruded on first seeing the stranger, whatever uneasiness might have poked at Captain Delano on first seeing this strange ship, whatever misgivings might have obtruded on first seeing the stranger would almost in any seaman's mind have been dissipated by observing that the ship, in navigating into the harbor, was drawing too near the land, a sunken reef making out of a sunken reef making out off her bow, meaning this ship is getting way too close to the land and there are dangerous reefs and rocks under the water that perhaps the, the crew or the captain can't see or aren't aware of. This ship is, is in danger and clearly unaware of its, its danger. This seemed to prove her a stranger indeed, not only to the sealer, to Captain Delano's boat, but the island, the area. Consequently, she could be no wanted freebooter on that ocean. She could be no habitual, you know, pirate or, or sort of, you know, independent ship. She could be no wanted freebooter on that ocean. With no small interest, Captain Delano continued to watch her. Um, just for the benefit of some of you, in case perhaps you're not used to this convention, ships, boats, in, in English conventional usage, are always referred to as female. They're referred to as she rather than it. Long history of this. Don't ask why, it just is the way it is. Boats, ships are she, her, not it. Captain Delano continued to watch her, a proceeding not much facilitated by the vapors partly mantling the hull, the, the fog that wraps around the bottom of the ship, through which the far matin light, matin being morning, light from her cabin, streamed equivocally enough, much like the sun. Equivocally means neither here nor there. It's in an undecided kind of fashion. If somebody gives an equivocal answer to a question, it's evasive. They haven't really answered the question. The light coming from the cabin in this boat, the, the captain's quarters, isn't really piercing the fog. That almost seems like a visual metaphor, doesn't it? Through which the far matin light from her cabin streamed equivocally enough, much like the sun, by this time hemisphered on the rim of the horizon, and apparently in company with the strange ship entering the harbor, which, wimpled by the same low creeping clouds, a wimple is the veil that a nun wears, too, to conceal her hair. So yes, the strange ship entering the harbor, which, wimpled by the same low, creeping clouds, showed not unlike a Lima Intrigante's one sinister eye, peering across the plaza from the Indian loophole of her dusky Saya Imanta. That's as far as I'm going to go with this close reading. Um, and please do not feel like I'm expecting you to read this closely through the entire novella. By no means. I simply wanted to take one particular section of this story that is densely, densely riddled with information and unpack some of it for you so that you can see the hints being provided in the text 
and see some of the kinds of places that these hide. Imagery, word choice, uh, tone. So that as you're reading, perhaps you have a, a better chance of picking up at least on some of these things that are going to be scattered in your way. Um, there's, there's, so, there's so much more, but we're going to stop there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this close reading. I hope that it's turning your wheels, illuminating some of your thoughts, that if you had, if, if you've already read some distance into the story and you had theories or questions, that these are making connections. Um, enjoy the rest of the reading, and I can't wait to talk it through with you. Bye, everyone.